guys, welcome back to Rob's Guide to Hearts of Iron 3, their finest hour. Uh, this is a continuation of my technology video. Uh, I'm mostly going to talk about doctrines, because I covered all the other the other types of technologies. I do want to return to the theory tab briefly. Be I talked about a few instances of where I think it's useful to use these, uh, such as nuclear physics research or uh, artillery research, if you're going to try and get uh, anti-tank guns ahead of time to avoid having to build a, a large armored force. Uh, as well as things like rocket science and jet engine research, that, which are just kind of difficult texts to research and, you know, texts where there's not a lot of different ways to gain uh, theory in them. But I just want to come back and I want to loop back and uh, talk about the, the, the mechanics of these texts um, and why they're mostly not useful, but they can be situationally useful. Um, so what do they do? Well, first of all, one important thing to, to note is that they are all difficulty one technology, so they're very easy to research uh, comparatively, compared to most technologies, they're, they're fairly easy to research. So if I put this in here, you see that this tech will be done in just over five months if I'm doing the math correctly, yeah, just over five months. And so that's pretty easy compared to, you know, a, a, a lot of other, like, I don't know, let me pick one here. Like, you know, it's a reasonably easy tech to research, so that's good. Uh, they're also not slow, they're, they're not, um, they're not sped up by anything though, so as the game goes on, they, they won't, you won't research them faster. Uh, so that's one thing to to keep in mind. They do at uh, they do two things. Uh, they have two effects basically. They reduce the theory decay. So I, I mentioned in the last video that every one of these theories uh, te theory skills here um, decays by one every calendar year, right? So re reducing reducing that decay by 10% means it's going to reduce by 0.9 instead of 1 and that can give you an edge for certain areas of theory cer certain types of technologies that rely heavily on theory now you'll you remember that i mentioned that most uh most upgrade technologies like weapons upgrade technologies rely more heavily on practical than they do on theory or doctrines uh and most doctrine texts rely more heavily on combat experience than they do on the doctrine text. So so that's one of the reasons why these are not particularly cost effective technologies. Like, you know, taking five you know, five months of, of one leadership to research uh, I don't know, let's think of an example, infantry warfare, even though you're getting the the even though your your theory will dec decay less over time, uh, it it takes it takes a lot of infantry it takes a lot of gains in infantry uh, text to to actually make that pay for itself. Uh, now, keep in mind that they do increase theory by one, so you are getting a reasonable boost, right? So you're increasing your theory by one, and you're decreasing the decay. So it is it is it is a reasonable boost, but it you know it because theory doesn't actually play that big a role in terms of how quickly you, you research these texts, the, the gains are very marginal. So let's talk about instances where you would use them. Well, I, I, one, you know, there's a couple that I've already mentioned, like nuclear physics, rocket science, and jet engine, uh, where you are researching, you know, something like this 1940 level, you know, difficulty 10 tech nuclear research is going to take you a long time. So any, any nuclear physics theory that you can get will speed that up. And and having the decay, decreasing the decay is not a bad thing either because you'll be able to, you know, most nations start the game with, you know, zero or close to zero nuclear physics. The UK starts with a one. But just, just increasing that to, say, three by, by teching this up to, to 1938 and then having it decay 20% slower is going to make a big difference in terms of how fast you're going to get that. And because of the nature of nuclear research, the faster you get these techs, like, the impact on the game is huge, right? Because once you have nuclear bombs, you're in a whole different... It's a whole different game, right? So, so there. That is one instance. Uh, I would argue as well that the rocket uh, science is not a bad one, um, because there are very, very few ways to increase uh, rockets. Uh, there are very, very few ways to increase rocket theory. Uh, uh, there's the rocket artillery tax. And then there's these this handful here, but most of these are like one-time techs. These two here, and then and then there's the um, the secret ones here. Mo most of those are kind of like one-time techs, 
uh, and and so if you want to if you want to say if you want to rely on uh, if you want to use rockets for strategic bombing and stuff and you want to get them maybe a little bit early uh, then it might be might be worth doing uh, in terms of jet engine research the same would apply uh, obviously theoretical jet engine uh, is a fairly it's a level four tech and most nations start with zero theory in it so getting a point or two of theory might speed up that tech but that being said uh, you know, it's it's you're just not going to you're 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 typically going to get jet engine quite late. Now it's a very very difficult tech, so that's you know this this level 14 is I think it's probably the highest difficulty level of any tech, right? So so having one or two rounds of the jet engine research might allow you to get this a little bit earlier and and speed up that research, which will otherwise otherwise take quite a long time. But, you know, the impact of jets on this game is pretty marginal. I mean, jet engines do vastly increase your, your speed. Um, and they, they, they really put your, your interceptors in sort of in another league in the long term. But, uh, but you know, again, the, the impact is going to be marginal at the end of the game. So whether you research it or not, it is certainly worthwhile to do jet engine research uh, in theory. But in theory uh but but it you know the impact on the game is going to be pretty marginal until you actually get your jets so so for nations that don't have a lot of leadership to spare doing something like researching this like maybe the uk the us and uh germany can can afford to sort of put a point of research into this a couple times early on and and or even later on you could wait until 1940 and then do the 1918 or 1936 and 1938 uh you know and get get three points of jet engine research quickly to, to speed up so that you can actually get jets a little bit early. Um, certainly for nations that have a lot of leadership to spare, it can be a good strategy. For a nation like France or Italy or Japan, you don't have, or the Soviet Union, you don't have the leadership to spare. Uh, and you are going to desperately need to be getting your infantry and armor techs up to date and your land doctrines up to date. And every single point of research that you're allocating is, is, is going to be... Uh, going to have more impact on the first few years of the war. And if you're playing as France or the, or the Soviet Union, particularly France and Italy, the early war years of the war are very, very important. Uh, if you, you know, as France, for example, if, if you don't prepare yourself to to be attacked by Germany, well, you're just you're just not going to survive, right? You you if you if you get encircled or if if the Germans break through and they take too much too much ground you you may never ne never be able to bounce back from that so it's a bit of a it's a bit of a tall order to be doing jet engine research when you're when you kind of have an existential threat uh so that's that's one aspect uh in terms of just generally using these though so there's a few technologies that do rely more heavily on theory for example um Chemical engineering. The the resource techs here all use chemical engineering. I believe that the only techs that use res that use chemical engineering, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so so you know, there's there's there isn't too much harm in in doing one level one maybe one level of this to reduce the decay, especially since these technologies uh, you may not be researching them all at once and and getting getting your chemical engineering up to a certain level and kind of maintaining it there will allow you to research these faster. Uh, you certainly don't want to be researching these ahead of time right so if you're if you if, like the united kingdom for example you you know you're, you're you're gonna you're gonna lose two points of chemical engineering research before you actually start researching these typically so doing one level of chemical engineering might not be a bad idea especially because these rely a hundred percent on theory so so that this 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 one probably pays for itself uh, I would argue that this a similar thing can be said for electrical engineering because the radar technology uses theory 50% and practical 50%. So so maybe doing one level of one or two levels max of the electrical engineering if you want to get radar early might not be a bad idea. Also the computer techs here are pure theory techs. So so you know getting getting electronic computing machine faster because you've put a point or two into electronic engineering is, is certainly not a bad thing. Uh, you could say the same for uh, mechanical engineering. There are there are two uh, agriculture, uh, sorry, there are, there are three actually, agriculture, mechanical computing machine, and supply production. 
uh, which all are pure theory texts in terms of what influences their research speed. Uh, and, and so, you know, getting, getting a point or two in, in mechanical engineering, if you wanted to get your agriculture, mechanical computing and supply production up quicker, uh, wouldn't certainly wouldn't hurt. This might be the case. This might be worth doing for countries that start with, uh, out agriculture. That's, that's, that's very out of date. Uh, and so certainly not the worst strategy. Uh, I would say though with any of these three that whether you research them or not is going to have a, pretty, a, a very marginal impact on the game. Uh, and once again, there, there might be technologies that are simply more pressing. Uh, might, might be technologies that are simply more pressing. I also, I would not research these over and over and over again. You know, if it's 1940 and you're still researching these, I think that's that, at that point, even though you've, you've reduced the decay to next to nothing at that point, or, you know, or to 50% or whatever, I mean, it, it, you know, the, the, the impact of these is lessens uh, uh, as the campaign goes on, because you're going to spend, you know, you'll, you'll have researched more and more texts and, and things like that. And also, as I mentioned with the practicals, you want to get your practicals up to between 5 and 10. Well, once you've gotten your theory above, say, 5, the, the returns, especially for theory, uh, are you really do have diminishing returns. So, so I wouldn't put more than one or maximum two levels into any of these technologies. Uh, in terms of... Uh, other, the other ones, these I can sort of group all the rest of them together. You know, jets, rockets, and nuclear are kind of your advanced theory. Uh, these ones kind of concern industry and are somewhat worthwhile. Uh, the rest of them just concern just all the rest of the stuff that you build. So I go through them quickly. Uh, two that I would absolutely never research uh, are militia and mobile warfare research. I would actually, infantry, militia, and mobile warfare research, I just don't see it because... Infantry techs are level zero and level one, so they're very quick to research, and the theory has very little impact on them. Uh, obviously, some of these other infantry techs, uh, you know, you can see that, but this only, rec you know, this only 30%, it only impacts it by 30% infantry theory for like mountain infantry, marine infantry, airborne infantry. Uh, it's just the, the, the gains are so marginal by researching a level of this that I, I really wouldn't bother. And you tend to research a lot of infantry techs, so your, your theories tend to gonna be above five for that. And yeah, much more important to focus on getting your practical up for that. Militia as well, these are all level zero techs. Uh, and uh, mobile. Did I mention mobile? Yeah, mobile warfare research is really useless because uh, the only thing that uses it is cavalry and then these two techs. So there are a grand total of six techs that use it. Typically, you would not research cavalry past, I believe it's 19... I think it's the level two or something that unlocks this. If I'm not mistaken, but once you've unlocked motorized infantry, that you're never going to research these again. They're level zero techs anyway, and you, you know once you get to a certain level here, you get to level three, then you'll you, you might you may or may not research mechanized infantry. But once again, uh, it's influenced more by the practical than it is by the theory anyway. So so really really no point in researching that. Um, I would argue that autumn are. Artillery, well, artillery, I mentioned a case where you would use it if you want to get your anti-tanks ahead so that you get that higher piercing value. So that's that's worth doing. Um, anything that you want to research a lot ahead of time or early uh, in, in terms of the more difficult technologies, uh, artillery, automotive, naval, and submarine, uh, certainly somewhat worthwhile. So that's one case where you would use artillery. That's probably the only case, though, for anti-tank. In terms of automotive, automotive is actually not a bad one to put one level into, automotive research. And the reason is because if you are a country that's going to rely heavily on tanks, you're going to do, you're going to research four of these it, to get them up to 1936. Uh, and in, in Britain's case, for example, that would actually be five techs. Then you're going to do another four to get to open up self-propelled artillery brigade. You're going to do one tech there, and you're probably going to research, you know, two, three, four of these regularly. Uh, and if you open heavy tank brigades, then it's even more, right? So you do end up doing a lot of technologies. And even though they only rely 30% on automotive theory, the impact of having the 10% less decay may may actually have a little bit of an impact in the early game. But once again, I would only ever do one round of it. So not the end of, not the worst idea to, sorry, not, the, not that one, automotive research, not the worst idea to do one round of this. Uh, the difference is going to be is going to be fairly marginal, but if you know that you're going to be using tanks a lot, and most countries are going to be using tanks at some point in the game, uh, you know, might be worth might be worth doing. 
Uh, the same, I, I would say the same goes for aeronautic research. Uh, aeronautic research, especially if you're using more than one type of plane, you, you may end up researching something like, you know, six, seven, eight different technologies regularly in, in this, in this, um, in this, in these, in these texts here. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the radar texts, um, the radar techs are, you know, are another another reason to put at least one put one point into electronic engineering. But I, again, I would only ever do one round of it. Uh, I have a hard time advocating submarine research because, again, these are pretty easy techs to research overall. They're all skill one. This is difficulty three. Uh, I have a pretty hard time uh, advocating them. And two of these techs use uh, use electronic electronic engineering theory. Uh, and these ones are only relying on, you know, 30% once again. So, so, you know, I don't know. Maybe if you really want to have, if you what if your goal, for example, is to get to acoustic torpedo as quickly as possible, which could be a vi viable strategy for Germany, then maybe doing one rounds of, uh, submarine engineering research might not hurt. Naval engineering is another one uh, that might not be a bad idea to just do one round of at the beginning of the game, especially if you're a country like Britain uh, or Italy or Japan that's likely to, to, to research, you know, 8, 9, 10, 12 naval techs regularly over the course of the game. Once again, even though it only has a 30% impact, um, that, that, you know, the more techs you research of a certain theory type, the more the impact of that one point of leadership dedicated to the theory tech is going to have. So over the course of a game, I'm sure that doing one level of naval engineering research will, will by, by decreasing the decay and giving you that extra point of theory, uh, will will probably have a, a fairly you know a, re a measurable impact on the amount of leadership it costs to research naval techs over the course of the game. So I think that pretty much covers it off, especially some of the more difficult naval techs like the carrier ones but i think i think overall it's still worth it because there's just so many naval techs um but yeah so so i think that covers it for the theory tab one other instance that you could argue would not be such a bad idea to do would be countries that for example let's say you're playing as italy and you want to start by uh getting your navy up to date and then do some automotive and then do your tank research later when you're say fighting the soviet union well you might consider putting one point into automotive research early so that when you do when you decide to go back and try, try and get your tanks up to date in say 1940 or 1942 uh you 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 have a little bit more of an edge but I, you know, that again, the, the impact is the impact is pretty marginal at that point. So, anyway, that, I think that pretty much covers this off. Let's dive into land doctrines. Uh, land doctrines are going to be the most important doctrine texts. Uh, generally speaking, your army is your most important force. Obviously, there are situations like for Britain where you know the the navy has a so, sort of existential importance in the sense that you you can prevent any enemy invasion simply using your navy if you play your cards right, your navy and your air force. But overall, if you want to win the game, you're going to have to put boots on the ground. And you're going to have to use your your army. So so these are these are you know generally the most important of the three doctrine texts. Uh, the other thing I would say is that uh, obviously upgrading your certain key technologies, things like tank guns and anti-tank and generally having good infantry is, is going to give you the upper hand in battles, but ultimately the most important statistic is not piercing, it's not soft attack, it's not hard attack, it's organization. Um, the longer your units can stay in battle, the more likely they are to be able to whittle down the enemy and win, even if they're using inferior weapons. So this this will be the case, for example, for the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, if you have more, if you have a bigger army than Germany, your individual divisions might not be very powerful. Uh, your individual brigades might not be very powerful, but you can overwhelm the enemy with uh, with uh, y the sheer quantity of divisions, and what one of the things that will help you doing that help you do that is to have divisions that have very good organization. So even if they're even if they have inferior weapons. So overall, I would say the longer the game progresses, the more important doctrines are, and the less important your weapons upgrades are. With the exception of you know certain key technologies like these radar technologies for air and stuff, right? So that's a fairly general a good general principle about doctrines now when you look at the land doctrines there are four uh let's name them off here you can see them here 
Uh, there's the Spearhead Doctrine, the Superior Firepower Doctrine, the Grand Battle, Battle Plan Doctrine, and the Human Wave Doctrine. Uh, I would not, uh, I would encourage you not to think of these as uh, opposing doctrines or alt alternate alternative doctrines. They are not alternatives to one another. You're going to need to, you're going to need to use certain aspects of each of these doctrines uh, in order to succeed in this game in the long run. So I, you know, I know other Hearts of Iron games, particularly Hearts of Iron 2 and, and Black Ice, actually uh, tend to have the Allies have one doctrine and the Axis have another doctrine. In this game, at the end of the day, any country that's going to use tanks is going to need to research some of these, right? Any country that's going to use uh, uh, motorized units is going to have to research some of these, uh, you know, and, and, and most countries use motorized units and tanks and, and infantry, so they're going to need all three of these, right? Um, obviously, there are some ones down here that pertain to uh, that pertain to militia that are a little bit militia and garrisons that are a little bit less important. But the other thing about these technologies is that uh, almost a lot of these technologies uh, give a lot of bonuses to different types of units, and they also they also give other bonuses that we'll we'll talk about. So you know you can see guerrilla warfare here gives you uh, supply consumption minus one and ambush or large front. You know it's a it's a t large front is a technology that mainly concerns. Uh, militia and garrisons, but it also gives all units a three point uh, three percent increase to shock and uh, and the you know the HQ supply consumption as well, right? So so you know not many of these technologies have have a function even for countries that aren't going to use the, the types of units that they're designed for. So that's a good thing to keep in mind, and and you should get to know the the benefits of these. Uh, yeah, the more you play the game, the more you should get to know them. So let's talk about. Um, how these technologies are organized and what their basic functions are. Uh, so there's a few things that they do. For every brigade type in the game, one of these technologies increases their organization. I think. I don't think there's an organization increase. There's maybe one or two units that don't have an organization increase. But yeah, anyway, you can see, for example, um, typically there's one technology that increases organization. So for infantry, that would be infantry warfare. For um, for uh, motorized and mechanized units, that would be mechanical offensive. Uh, for armor, that would be Blitzkrieg. And what else is there uh, for, for militia? Partisans, garrisons, and military police. It's people's army, and I'm trying to think if I've missed anything. Oh yeah, uh, for artillery units, it's assault concentration. For motorized artillery units, no, it's assault concentration as well. So you know these five techs here increase. Oh, and special forces have their own too. Yeah, special forces um, get the you know have their own technology for organization. So these six technologies, their main function is to is to increase the organization of certain brigades and so those are very very important ones the more brigades that you use of those uh, of, of those the, the more of, of each of those brigade types you use the more the, the, the more each of those technologies is important there's other things that these techs do though so there's typically for each brigade type there is one that does organization and there's one that does morale um, morale is basically organization regain so it's a little bit less important than organization, but it will al allow your units, the faster, when, when your units are done a battle, whether they've lost or won, the faster they regain their organization, the faster you can put them back into battle. So, so morale has an indirect effect on organization and, and, and the fighting capacity of your unit. So it is an important statistic. If faced between the choice between morale and organization, I would always take more organization because, you know, you're better off winning that first battle than, than you know, losing it and having to come back or, you know, it's it, anyway, I, I would tend to lean towards organization um, rather than morale. However, most of the most of the morale technologies in here for the various unit types also contribute to what are called combat events. And that's where you see like assault, rec reckless assault, uh, and things like that. Uh, and so what are combat events? I will be showing you how combat events work in my, I'm going to do a video, I, I know it's been a long time coming, but I'm going to do a video on land combat where I, you know, I'll put it down to speed one and we'll really watch what happens when two divisions are duking it out. Uh, or a stack of divisions are fighting, or whatever, right? Uh, but um, uh, those, the way, basic, the, what you can hold on to now as an idea is that 
there are offensive combat events and there are defensive combat events and each event ha each event has a an, an a, has an opposing event that is used to counter it uh, and these events give you various bonuses, things like attack and defense bonuses. So they're not statistics in their own right, but they increase the likelihood of your leaders adopting certain tactics on a divisional level that will give them major bonuses in combat. So they are important and they contribute a huge amount to whether you, whether you win battles. And so which doctrines you pick here uh, should reflect not only what brigades you have, uh, but also um, which combat events you think are the best are the most likely to help you and uh, you know it's hard to memorize all the combat events uh, and what they do and I certainly haven't got them all memorized although I have a general sense of each of them uh, but the, the most important thing for you to remember is is which ones are offensive and which ones are defensive and that's what I would encourage you to focus on when you're looking at which doctrines because a lot of countries ideally any any major country is going to want to research almost Almost every doctrine in, in, in this tree and have them up to date as much as possible but you may not have enough leadership for that and so you may uh, you may end up making choices as to which doctrine you get up to date first uh, and especially early in the campaign before you've taken maybe you've taken some enemy territory and increased your leadership and things like that right and gotten some land experience so these technologies research faster so uh, if you are playing as a a country that is going to be mostly on the defense so let's say France or the Soviet Union then I would focus on technologies that are folk that are uh, that give you defensive combat events so uh, elastic defense gives you uh, there's you get, increases the likelihood of three defensive uh, combat events, tactical withdrawal, elastic defense, and backhand blow. Um, let's just go through these quickly here. Um, mm -mm, delay doctrine is also a, a good defensive uh, uh, doctrine, land doctrine tech. Um, what else? Uh, central planning increases counterattack. And guerrilla warfare increases ambush. So those are those are the four technologies that have the most impact in terms of defensive combat events, and and they will be quite worthwhile to research for uh, for countries like France and the Soviet Union that are likely to be on on the defense. Uh, I haven't talked about these unlockable ones yet, but one thing I would say about central planning uh, is that it unlocks Grand Battle Plan, and Grand Battle Plan is one of the most important defensive technologies in the entire game. So, in fact, it's just one of the most important technologies in the, in the entire game, period. Uh, w before I go into the offensive uh, combat uh, events, uh, I should talk about as well, you'll notice that a lot of these uh, increase the statistics of HQ brigades. And it, you, you are able to use HQ brigades in combat. The only way to increase their statistic, statistics are through land doctrines. So if you are a country that is going to you, going to research you know all of these and keep all of these up to date, then you know use, planning to use your core HQs in combat is maybe not such a bad idea. Uh, although we'll talk more about that when I get into the order of battle, but you'll notice here that for example, elastic defense gives more org to your HQ units. Uh, you know, and there's a number of other, there's a number of other uh, texts here that, you know, there's plenty of them that these ones decrease the supply consumption. Uh, where else? Let's see here. Sent, this one increases toughness. You know, there's a handful of these that increase. Let's find them all. Yeah, so these eight techs increase this, uh, give bonuses to HQ brigades. Now, I, I really do question the the value of you know HQ defensiveness and HQ toughness uh, as a statistic. It's, a, it's actually a pretty major increase. Two points of increase, or I, probably one point of increase is a pretty major increase, but at the end of the day, your HQs are not powerful fighting units, so you, I would not, I would almost generally speaking, I would disregard the HQ bonuses that these techs give, with the exception of mobile warfare, and I'll talk more about mobile warfare uh, later. But generally speaking, I would disregard the the HQ bonuses that are given by these. Uh, I just, I you know, soft attack, hard attack. Like you know, you're not you're not gonna you're not gonna rely on your HQ brigades to be doing your 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 main military uh, your your main land combats. Uh, so so certainly those little bonuses uh, do are good 
good if you're using HQs, uh, core HQs as combat units. But I mean, they're, they're, don't don't pick these techs based on what they on based on the stat boost they give to HQ units. Uh, so I talked about the dif I talked about the defensive doctrine, um, the defensive combat events. Let's talk about the offensive ones. So. Mobile Warfare increases Breakthrough and Masterful, masterful Breakthrough. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Bl this uh, Blitzkrieg increases Blitz and Masterful Blitz. Integrated Support increases Encirclement. Encirclement's a very powerful combat event, so keep that in mind. Mass Assault increases Assault and Reckless Assaults. And large front increases shock. So if I recall correctly, there are like four techs that increase defensive combat events and maybe five that increase these. I think so. Yeah. Anyway, um, so those those are the main offensive offensive technologies. Uh, and and I wouldn't worry, generally when you are playing on the offense, like when you're playing as Germany, uh, Germany does not really have trouble keeping up to date with land doctrines, so it, it's not really important to prioritize these simply because they're offensive. Germany can probably afford to research everything in this tree. Uh, in fact, they generally should. If you're playing as the Soviet Union, though, it may be worthwhile to let some of these fall behind and to increase and to focus on the defensive ones at first and then kind of switch gears later in the campaign and focus on the offensive combat events and you sort of change your doctrine over time that way uh, so that's worth keeping in mind um, so I want to go through we're going to talk a lot about this page um, I want to go through each of these technologies basically and and talk about which ones are high priority and which ones are low priority you'll notice uh, that a few of these Schwerpunkt, Blitzkrieg, Mechanized Offensive and Combined Arms Warfare are very very difficult to research so that there are 10 difficulty uh, I would try and get them in the queue and get them up to date as soon as possible uh, so so even if you're playing as a defensive country uh, getting these two and uh, is, is not a bad idea uh, I'm going to talk about a few particular ones. Uh, obviously, like I said, that your biggest priority is going to be the organization for the organization techs for the uh, the brigades that you use the most often. Generally speaking, uh, infantry warfare is is the single most important doctrine tech because the vast majority of armies will be com will be comprised principally of of um, Infantry, if you are doing a militia uh, spam type strategy as Nationalist China, can, which can be very cool, instead of researching infantry warfare, you can research the level 3 technology, uh, the, the difficulty level 3 technology, People's Army, uh, and get your militia organization up. Uh, and and that, you know, that can be a cheaper way, and then you can do this one later when you're actually upgrading your militia to infantry. So that can be one strategy as well. If you're really, really leadership poor, like Nationalist China, you can focus on these guys because they're generally easier to research, and then you know, move up to these ones and the other ones later. So that's one strategy, but infantry warfare is a very important technology. Uh, as you build armor, Blitzkrieg becomes more and more important. Uh, I would say, though, when you're playing as Italy, if you're not going to build a lot of armor, then I would hold off on Blitzkrieg because um, because it's a very difficult tech to research. You don't have a lot of leadership, and if you're not fielding any armor, then obviously obviously the Blitz and Masterful Blitz events are good events, but you know not that uh, not not as important as making sure that your infantry warfare techs are up to date. Italy might also want to do something like special forces so that it can use um, you know Marines and stuff like that. So good to keep in mind. Um, I would say that uh, mass assault is also important, uh, both because of the assault and reckless assaults, but mainly because, uh, once again, I said that organization is more important than morale, but you simply have so many infantry brigades as most countries that, you know, the morale also becomes important. Uh, m you know, something like armor morale. Armor morale is probably a bit of a luxury for for um, most most countries that aren't going to build a huge amount of armor, but uh, you know, infantry morale is not a luxury. Infantry morale is kind of a must. They're also in the same doctrine, so you'll be able to increase the technologies a little bit quicker. 
So those are two very, very important ones. Uh, mobile warfare is surprisingly important uh, because the I, I mentioned that I didn't I encouraged I discouraged you from uh, focusing on the HQ effects of these texts, but HQ max speed is surprisingly important. So don't feel that this has to be up to date at all times. But I would at least get it to the level where you unlock spearhead doctrine, so level three, be, because having the extra 1.5 or so kilometers per hour um, speed for your HQs is is going to make your whole army a lot more flexible. It's a little bit uh, of a luxury for some countries, but at least getting this tech to level 3 is probably a good idea because, you know, if your HQs get bogged down and or, and, or encircled, it's a real hassle. Uh, constantly having HQ brigades shatter uh, and kind of get left behind, or if they can't keep up with your army while it's advancing, then it's a real, it's a real hassle. So, so not a bad tech to be researching. Um, another other ones that are particularly good attack movements. Attack movement is a tech that simply affects the one statistic attack movement, and that is basically how long it takes for your units to get into combat. And so uh, this is a pretty important one, especially uh, the more offensive you're playing. If you're playing as Germany or as you know, but most countries are going to want a few a few levels of attack movements, um, attack movement speed. Uh, they're going to want a few, you know, it, it, it will speed up your your fronts, your your divisions are going to move faster along the front. It doesn't increase the movement speed of your division, but it increases how quick, how long it takes for them to get into combat. So, you know, for example, if you're being attacked, uh, if you're being attacked here and then you send this unit to it, like say that, you know, this, this province here is being attacked and you send this unit to, to, to counterattack, uh, you know, having a higher attack movement will mean that this unit enters combat faster, and this unit has to spend less time defending. So it does. It, it's a fairly important statistic, and it's once again, it's going to give a lot more flexibility and mobility to your to your entire fronts, just like mobile warfare. Uh, the other one uh, is is um, operational level organization, which is attack delay, and every time you every time your units. Uh, enter, attacks another unit uh, after the after the battle is done. It it has to wait uh, at the beginning of the game. It's like it has to wait like three. Uh, you know, I think it's almost a week that it has to wait before it can enter another battle, right? Well, this reduces that by 24 hours. So, d getting a few levels of this, this is one of the most important doctrine techs in the in, in the game, and almost all countries are going to want to have this. Certainly, I would say that your infantry warfare and your, your mass assault are going to come first if you're really strapped for leadership, but these three techs... Are not are are not far off in terms of the their their priority. Um, I would also say that getting central planning high, a counterattacks a decent combat event. But m the more important thing about getting central planning up is that is get, getting access to grand pa battle plan. Grand battle plan gives you a five percent reinforcement chance. Uh, to give you a sense, most most divisions have a reinforcement chance of like 0.3 percent at the beginning of the game. So this is a massive increase. Uh, and reinforcement cha chance every hour of combat when you have brigades in reserve every hour combat there's there's a, basically a dice roll as to whether they enter the battle so if you if you let's say you get and I'll go into more detail about this later but if you get attacked in this province and you you know you throw in that division to 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 uh, you, you move this division here into into that province uh, to to shore up the defense uh, it's gonna. There's, you know, that division won't enter combat uh, in t until it's until it's got a um, until it's past its role for for reinforcement. So the five percent increase may not seem like that much, but it it's massive. So you want to unlock this tech, and almost all countries are gonna want to have that tech at some point, even if it comes a bit late. You're still gonna want it. Uh, let's talk about some of these other texts here, the important ones. Uh, you know, one of the things you can think about uh, if you, in terms of which text not to research, uh, it may it may be worth. You know, you may simply, if you're leader, if you're strapped for leadership, you might just want to avoid building special forces. Even if you're, say, Italy, maybe you just rely on your infantry to do your amphibious actions because you're not going to do that many of them anyway. Uh, maybe you just kind of use a blunt force approach with lots of infantry rather than marines, and that's just one less tech you have to research. 
the other thing, the same can be said for some of the motorized support brigades. Maybe you're not going to build any motorized support brigades, and so you know you can you can forgo elastic defense. Those are ones that are kind of easy to avoid researching. Um, I you know I would say the same for mechanized offensive, except that combined armed warfare is any any nation that's going to use armored units should should absolutely get spearhead doctrine which which cuts the combat width of armor in half so combat width of armor is normally two this reduces it to to um minus one although super heavy armor is always combat width two uh this one here gives a plus 10 percent combined ar arms bonus to to armored units so that's also huge uh these two technologies here are going to are going to i would say double the effectiveness or even more of your armored brigades so i would highly advise unlocking these for any nation that's going to build even if you only have like 10 or 15 armored divisions uh or 10 or 15 armored brigades i would this this is this is worth worth getting to so get mechanized offensive high enough and get mobile warfare high enough to to unlock these at the very least after that these become a little bit less important um what else uh these two here uh shock and ambush are both very good combat events so hq supply consumption is surprisingly it, it looks tiny the 0 0.01 uh, but it's not really. Uh, 0 0.01 supplies is 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 surprisingly, you know, it, it, you have a lot of HQ brigades, especially if you're playing as like the Soviet Union. You're going to have a lot of HQ brigades along the front, and they do consume a lot of supply. So reducing their supply consumption is not negligible. Uh, this one's a little bit less important though, because human wave is a, is human co is unit co cooperation. Unit co cooperation is is a reduction of stacking penalty. So this is actually not a bad tech to aim for. Again, not a super high priority, but I would gradually increase this and then unlock that eventually. So, but again, don't make HQ supply consumption a, a priority. These are lower priority technologies. Uh, People's Army is also, you know, many countries can simply ignore this, even if you're going to use port garrisons. Those port garrisons are basically there to dissuade the enemy rather than actually do a lot of fighting. So, I would, you know, maybe put one, one or two points into this if you've got the spare leadership or whatever, but this is a very low priority tech. Uh, you know, so in terms of the top priority ones, just to reiterate, because we've talked about a lot. Oh yeah, I didn't talk about superior firepower. Uh, superior firepower. I would not actually rush this. A lot of people want to unlock that extra brigade and divisions, but it really depends on the circumstances. If you're playing as say France, uh, I don't know whether that extra brigades. You know, that might. It, it's a real toss up, right? Because a lot of countries that are a bit strapped for manpower, like France, uh, Italy. Uh, the USA at the beginning of the game, although the USA usually should get that technology, even the United Kingdom, uh, countries that are strapped for manpower at the beginning of the game, and, and, and even Germany as the Eastern Front gets more intense, I, I'm not sure how worthwhile it's going to be to put that extra brigade in your divisions. Probably, if you're, if you're adding a support brigade, then, you know, probably the combined arms is going to help. Uh, but you also, it also has to do with how much IC you have, right? If you don't have a lot of IC, or if your IC is if you're if you're playing as a country that needs to build a massive army, even the Soviet Union or Germany, for example, you're you the last thing you want to be doing is using up all your IC building 50 more support brigades for for all of your divisions, right? So I would say this is not necessarily worth rushing um, for all countries because. By the time you unlock it, you might have more important things to do with your IC than adding a fifth brigade to all your divisions. Uh, but you know, it's certainly it's cer certainly having the fifth brigade is very 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 powerful. It's just that I I, I don't know that I would advocate. Um, that I would advocate on, uh, you know, rushing it. Also, because tactical command structure is, is not that great a doctrine. I mean, it's certainly if you have a lot of motorized units, then, and and even if you're for your armored units, which will all have uh, motorized units, you know, being able to get their the morale of those brigades higher up is is not a is certainly not a bad thing. But I this is not, you know, I would of of these four or five technologies, well, large formations, uh, you know, this is not that important. Uh, it, it is, you know, it is very important, but it's it's not it's not a high priority early on. 
Uh, countries that will want to research this as soon as possible, I would say the United States uh, be and even the United Kingdom to a certain degree, partly because they don't have any land borders, so they're able to quietly build their army and build their army exactly as they wish without having a lot of units that are actually in combat early on. So they kind of have the luxury of, d you know, quietly deploying their armies and, and setting up their brigades and everything. The Soviet Union could also benefit from it, uh, especially because you don't need, need to enter the war until 1941. But yeah, anyway, it's like I said, I, I, I don't, I don't want to say this is not a good technology. I, I, obviously, the extra brigade is huge in terms of the, the strength that it gives the division. But, uh, you know, d just keep in mind that Putting a 5th Brigade in all your divisions takes a lot of IC. It may mean that you'll have less divisions overall. Uh, it may also consume a lot of manpower or spread your manpower in ways that aren't that useful. If you have a very wide front, like the Eastern Fronts, you need a lot of divisions. Uh, and it may be better to spread your manpower more thin as a country like France uh, than to have it concentrated in bigger divisions. So it's it really is just... just you know, keep in just just think about all those factors when you're deciding how soon to research this. Certainly, researching it early has no penalty in the sense that you can simply choose to not put the fifth brigade in your division. But then, what's the point, right? Uh, large formations, large formations are. Uh, you know, is going to is going to reduce the combat width of militia to 0 0.5 as well as partisans. Uh, this is useful if you are going to do the militia spam strategy, mostly as nationalist China, perhaps as the Soviet Union as well, where you're going to build. You, you have a country that has a lot of manpower, so you're going to build like hundreds of militia divisions, and they are just going to overwhelm the enemy by sheer force of numbers. So it's an interesting strategy, and I'll, I'll probably do a video just on that strategy. So you know, I, again, this is not going to be important for the vast majority of, of nations because they're just not going to be using militia and it doesn't do anything except reduce the combat width of militia. It doesn't. It does not affect garrisons by the way so this is not worthwhile if you're going to do something like stack six garrisons in Hong Kong or something this is not not going to help you there. Uh, right so I think I've covered off all the important text let's go through one more time what I think the most important ones are uh, probably I don't I'm not know if I'm, I don't know if I'm putting these in order uh, maybe like this something like this I think probably the most important uh, obviously assault concentration is going to be pretty important as well uh, because you tend to have a lot of artillery division uh, brigades although I would I would still put it at the bottom of this list unlocking grand battle plan is so vital um, that I would uh, I I would say that having your artillery brigades be kind of weak is just not that big a deal, uh, whereas having your infantry brigades is is you need you need them to have good organization. So this is probably the order I put them in in terms of priority. And after that, I would start looking at armor, and I would start looking at whether I want to get superior firepower. Uh, human wave is not a bad one. Uh, you know, I I think this is this is basically what I would what I would prioritize if you're a leadership strapped country but like i said you probably want to research all of these so keep that in mind naval doctrines naval doctrines a uh, little this will be this should be a little bit simpler okay so uh, rather than org and morale uh well they do affect org and morale but naval doctrines are the best way to increase the positioning of your navy and positioning is the most the more important statistic than either organization or morale P positioning determines uh, you know how much friendly fire there is. Whether your uh, whether your navy is able to adequately, whether your escorts are able to adequately protect their the capital ships. Whether the capital ships are, are able to get into firing distance and and you know hit the enemy and stuff like that. So positioning is very important. Uh, in naval text, you want to prioritize the text that increase positioning for the types of units that you're going to do. You'll notice that light cruisers and carriers are in the same doctrine, fleet auxiliary carrier doctrine. So if you are trying to limit the amount of leadership you put into naval text, then you might want to only research light cruisers and carriers. And you're going to, these two texts here are going to be the most important. Crew training, organization morale never hurts, but it's, it's less important. Carrier crew training this is, is the same, a little bit less important. Uh, naval underway replenishment. I would I I would never advocate using the sortie mission. So I would never research this tech. It's not a good technology. Uh, I, it, it, I I just can't advise it. Uh, sort sorties are basically sending your fleets out for one quick 
strike and then sending them back. You could also use the move order to do the same thing. I just don't think it's that useful. The AI uses sorties a lot, uh, and so let the AI research this, but it's a waste of leadership to do so. Uh, this one's fine. Surface detection for carriers uh, is not is, is, is fine, but not a very high priority. Not a very high priority. Uh, you know, it's not bad. If you're going to rely heavily on carriers, I, I'd say you probably want to research all five of these. Uh, uh, certainly, though, focus on these two first. Carrier Task Force is a fantastic technology that gives you 5% keg duty efficiency, so that's, that's really going to make a big difference. Uh, all carrier heavy navies like Japan and the USA and uh, the UK and Italy, if you're going to be doing carriers, or Germany, if you're going to be doing carriers, should try and get to this technology, so very important. I think this also increases the organization of kegs, so, so you know that's that's you're gonna want to you're gonna want to research that and, and move your way through these. But start with the positioning ones and move on to the other ones later. Sea lane defense. This is one of the reasons why a lot of people choose to build only battleships and destroyers, uh, as as you know for the same reason that you would build only uh, light cruisers and carriers. Uh, and that is certainly can work. I don't really advocate building a lot of battleships because they'll just end up losing to carriers anyway. However, uh, if you are going to build battleships or if you start with a lot of battleships, remember that these these technologies increase uh, units. They don't. It doesn't cost anything to give these upgrades to your units. So if you if you start like if you're the UK and you start with, I think you start with what is it? 12 battleships at the start of the game. That's, that's a lot of very useful, powerful ships that you can use for any manner of thing over the course of the game, even if they're not as important as your carriers. So increasing the their positioning is, is really not a bad idea, uh, even though even if you're not going to build any new ones. Uh, destroyer, the destroyer escort role technology is fairly important. It, it increases the efficiency of your escorts. That's these guys. So it will reduce the number of... It will, it will reduce the number of convoys that get attacked by enemy submarines, and it will also increase the number of submarines that the enemy has to build to effectively attack your convoys. So very fair, very useful technology for any country that has any destroyers, and arguably useful for, for countries that uh, you know have a lot of convoys, regardless of whether they're using destroyers or not. Uh, the, the crew training and, ba and battleship crew training very similar to what I said for uh, for light cruisers. Less important than these two, but still you know worth doing if you have the leadership to spare. Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, um, yeah. I, it's always it's not a bad idea to increase the organization morale, but it's less important. These two are very important, and these two don't. It doesn't matter what kind of navy you're building. Uh, target cho chance and target choice. Uh, have to do with whether your your ships are going to pick valuable targets to attack, and the target chance basically is their gunnery. So it's how often they're going to hit. So any now this does not affect uh, your carrier air groups, but it is vital for your surface fleets. So definitely at least one round of these technologies will have a you know will have a major impact on all naval engagements throughout the game. So, you know, I would say overall your naval doctrines are only as important as how many naval engagements you're going to have, but in the long run you're going to want to get some of this, these two. So, you know, that's kind of why I would say if you're going to get these two anyway, why not throw that one in too, you know? Why not throw destroyer escort roll in too? Uh, and the battleship ones if you're going to get, if you have the leadership for it. Uh, obviously if you're going to use submarines, uh, the two technologies that are, most, that are the most important are going to be trade interdiction submarine doctrine and submarine crew training. Uh, there is no... Oh, there's a positioning increase here for the submarines, but I don't think submarines use the same... When they're attacking convoys, the positioning doesn't matter, so it's really the convoy rating efficiency one. Uh, convoy rating efficiency for... for I believe this applies to all ships, but because submarines have a better convoy attack, it's going to be better for... It's going to, you know, essentially be a submarine-related technology. This one's a little bit less important, although um, uh, having the organization penalty reduced by 50% is pretty major. That's a huge, uh, that's a that's a huge uh, penalty reduction. So it may be worth researching both of these simply to unlock that 1941, the unrestricted submarine warfare tech. So worth doing. Oh, I forgot to talk about convoy com uh, commerce defense. Um, never researched this. 
just never. Uh, just uh, escort convoy efficiency. It it has nothing to do with uh, these guys. It has to do with these missions down here. And don't use these missions. They don't work. Uh, they don't work. Uh, they they are they are very very in a very very inefficient way. In those missions, what happens is your your escort fleets. It, it, it goes, it, it patrols back and forth along these lines to the limit of its range. Uh, but the way that convoys work and the way that convoy rating works, this submarine convoy rating is going to be like a circular patrol like this. So having a unit go back and forth is just not that effective. The likelihood that it's going to spot a submarine any time that it passes and that they're going to be in the same province at any time is just very, very low. So don't research this. It doesn't help. Unless you're doing it for historical flavor or role playing or something, uh, don't research it. So yeah, these two, if you're going to be using submarines to to do convoy raiding, uh, I have a hard time recommending cruiser warfare more than once because unless you're building a lot of heavy cruisers, certainly if one thing you can do if you want to kind of use the classic German Kriegsmarine strategy, you could go for light cruisers uh, and heavy cruisers because they use the same practical, and then go for these two. Uh, you know, that, that could be one strategy, but, you know, if anything, get the positioning up to, up to date. If you have a lot of, if you're playing as, say, the UK, you, if you're playing as a UK, you start with one level of this, though, and that's probably fine. Uh, if you have, a, you know, if you have a lot of heavy cruisers, then go for it, but I, I have a hard time recommending too many heavy cruisers at the end of the game. You know, you really need your carriers at that point, but... You know, if you have a lot of heavy cruisers, you might want to put one one or maximum two levels into that and one or two maximum two levels into this. But I would I have a hard time recommending them overall. Spotting is a very, very important technology. It increases the ability of your uh, your escort ships to to detect other ships. Obviously, if you're using carriers, if carriers become your main, the centerpiece of your fleet over time, combining the radar training for the carriers with the spotting will give an even better bonus. Uh, and that can really help when you're doing things like uh, sub hunting and just generally the, these two technologies. But of the two, uh, spotting is more important. Basing, uh, basing. We've talked about when we talked about industrial technology. So basing is very important. It'll allow you to repair ships better. It will allow you to supply more ships in your ports. It'll allow you to supply more units overseas. It's a very important technology, and, and most countries that have any kind, any level of overseas entanglement should be researching basing. Let's move on to air doctrines. Uh, so. Air doctrines are sorted, uh, you know, basically by unit type. Uh, fighter techs here. Uh, basically, this is a weird one, but uh, close air supports here. Uh, tactical bombers here. Naval bombers and heavy bombers here. However, however, uh, there are also... So not only do you have uh, the technologies that increase the organization and morale of these, you also have the mission efficiency technologies. So interception tactics, ground attack tactics, interdiction, logistical strike, installation strike, airbase strike, naval strike, keg duty efficiency is also one, um, port strike, strategic bombardments, uh, airborne assault efficiency, which is here, which I can't research because we haven't unlocked paratroopers. So the mission efficiencies are very, very important as well. So, and I would keep in mind that sometimes, uh, let's say that you're going to use tactical bombers as your main bomber. Well, if you're going to use ground attack ta as your main form of, of bombing, then you probably want to research ground attack tactics. So anyway, that's just a good thing to keep in mind. You're going to want to research the tactics that you use. For, for countries that are strapped on leadership, the, the, the most important tech is fighter pilot training. Uh, the other two important ones are going to be fighter ground crew training and interception tactics. These three technologies, if, if, you, if you do not have enough leadership or enough IC to build a, a very versatile air force, if you simply want to use interceptors to defend your territory, research, keeping these three up to date will go a long way towards that goal. 
even if you don't have the most high-tech fighters in the game, having the air intercept efficiency, the, the interceptor organization, and the interceptor morale is going to go a long, long way towards... Uh, towards defending your airspace, uh, morale is fairly important for interceptors because they, you know, their org gets cut down reasonably fast in air combats. And you know, when you when you cancel their mission and allow them to repair, uh, you, you know, the faster that org organization comes back, the 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 better off you are in terms of having overall air superiority in your airspace so very very important uh, one thing to note there is no efficiency mission for air superiority and that's one of the reasons why the air superiority mission is a very high risk mission if you have your air force on air superiority and the enemy is using intercept the enemy is going to be getting an efficiency bonus and you are not so that's why air superiority is a very risky mission unless you have a vastly superior air force or unless you have really hammered down the enemy to the point where their air force is crippled anyway so the efficiency isn't going to help them uh, let's talk about a few other techs in the fighter uh, in the fighter category here. Fighter ground control. If you are going to build ra uh, radar installations, which most major countries should, getting at least one or two levels of this will have a, a, a pretty high impact. Uh, if you're just going to do something, for example, like put level 10 radar in Dover and not use it for its combat impact, then this tech becomes less important. So I would also not research this to like level 40 or something. I mean, I, I don't, I think there's other techs that are a little bit more important than that. Uh, unless you have a lot of leadership to spare, this becomes a little bit less important. These two you should never research. Uh, they are a choice. If you're going to research them, only ever research one uh, because they, they increase the likelihood of your units targeting either bombers or fighters when they're in combat. If you increase both of them, if I increase both of these, I'm going to have an even chance of selecting both targets. So the difference between a 10% chance of bomber and, and fighter or a 20% chance of bomber and fighter is the same. This is like, this amounts to, either one amounts to 50-50. So I don't, generally don't touch these techs. That's my opinion. Uh, unless you want to do some kind of historical flavor, you know, like the British, for example, did bar bomber targeting focus in the early part of the war, and then later on they would focus a bit more on the fighters, but, you know, I, I don't see it. I don't see it. Uh, you, you know, hypothetically, you could focus on the bombers when you're in the defensive mode, say, as the Soviet Union, and then you could stop researching this and keep researching fighters later to to switch to, you know, trying to sweep the enemy fighters and, and gain air superiority, but I, I don't, I just, I can't advocate these two technologies in any way. They don't really work very well. Uh, these, uh, these technologies, one of the things I would keep in mind is that if you are going to have uh, ca carrier air groups, then you need six technologies to increase their organization. So, you know, and, and if you look at the amounts, it's plus 3% here, or sorry, plus 2% there, plus 4% there, plus 6% there. And so to get the same bonus for carrier air groups for organization, for example, as you get from fighter pilot training, you need to research all three of these. So any country that's going to have carrier, carrier air groups and any country that's going to rely heavily on them needs to research all three of these. And so it's not a choice. It's not a choice. I, I really do think that you, if you, know, you want to win, uh, your carrier air group organization is probably the symbol, single most important thing in terms of late game naval combat between carriers uh, more important than the statistics of the carriers uh, is is the organization of the aircraft as well as things like your um, air launch torpedoes and other technologies that affect your 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 carrier air groups here but very very important technologies uh, and I would say the morale is also fairly important uh, so keep that in mind so the cast pilot training and uh, ca cast ground training as well as fighter pilot and fighter ground training also affect the CAGs just like these two, two do. Um, in terms of ground attack, ground attack and interdiction are very similar missions. My advice to you is pick whichever one you prefer. Interdiction is more of a patrolling type uh, ground attack mission where it looks for units that are moving. And, and bombs them over a wider area. Ground attack is more of a pinpoint accuracy, pick the exact province you want to attack. I would tend to go with ground attack. So most countries, uh, you know, in terms of bombing missions, if, if you're gonna do, I would not research both ground attack and interdiction. I would pick which one makes more sense to you, depending on how you like to do air combat. 
Forward air control and battlefield interdiction are very similar to these two. I wouldn't research them. I just wouldn't. Uh, you know, whether you target reserves or or frontline targets, I don't I don't really see the you know the, a clear advantage uh, for one or the other uh, in terms of whether your ground attacks are going to help your land units win battles more. Attacking reserves units is valuable. Attacking uh, you know frontline units is is valuable. I don't see any advantage to picking one or the other, so don't research these two. That's my opinion. Uh, let's go back to let's go over to before we do. Tax. Let's go over back to the naval bombers uh, because I talked a little bit about you know you have to research these six for carrier air groups. Obviously, these two do organization for naval bombers as well, and that's pretty important if you're going to be using naval bombers a lot. More important for CAGs and naval bombers overall. Naval bombers are a more limited unit than CAGs. CAGs are more flexible. They can they can basically go anywhere on the map. Uh, if you are going to focus heavily on carrier air groups, not only would I do these these six. Um, let's say that you're just going to be using them for, for CAG duty. You're going to want naval strike tactics. You're going to want naval air targeting. Naval bombing target chance is going to increase the likelihood of your carrier air groups and your naval bombers of actually hitting targets in the sea. So this is going to make, make this is one of the techs that contributes to making uh, air units the, the determining factor at sea uh, because they're able to actually hit their targets. Uh, I would also strongly advise researching nav tactics because uh, if when you're doing uh, when your kegs are in like naval strike mode or whatever, uh, they they are going to be able to. If you sorry, I'll restart that. So if you're gonna if you're gonna just focus on keg duty, you're gonna need eight technologies basically to get the, the to get the most out of your carrier air groups in terms of these these air doctrines and if you keep those eight technologies up to date you will be a dominant force in terms of carrier air groups in the game uh, so keep that in mind it's it's a very it's a very research expensive way to do things but don't forget about these two texts they're very important uh, port strikes can be a very powerful uh, powerful way to rip through the enemy's navy using naval bombers or indeed carrier air groups. If you are going to do port strikes, I highly advise researching both port strike tactics and nav tactics. Part of the reason is that typically it will take a long time to wear those ports down, and it'll take a long time to wear the... Um, the naval units down in port as well. So I highly advise uh, reducing the organization penalty. Any of the texts that affect organization penalty are basically going to determine how many times in a row you can conduct the mission. So you send them out on continuous. At a certain point, they're going to run out of org and they're going to stop doing the mission or they're going to start to get seriously damaged and possibly shatter. Uh, so, so uh, you know, Reducing the org every time you get you go out on a mission you get an, you get a little bit of an org hit whether or not your aircraft is actually inter intercepted so I find that if you want to have lethal port strikes that having the combination of these two is really a good idea obviously that the efficiency tech is more important and even more important than that is the org tech but yeah um, I would say in general though that the org techs for bombers only go so far without the efficiency text for the missions that you're actually going to do. So uh, that kind of explains these ones. The same goes for naval strikes. You want uh, you want both of these. Uh, naval strikes, I don't find naval strikes to be super, super effective. Oh, yeah, they're fairly effective. Yeah, but so if you're going to be doing naval strikes, even if you're not using carrier air groups, uh, you're going to want both of these, as well as especially uh, naval air targeting. I think these three are very, very important, as well as the as well as the, uh, the, the the basic pilot training and ground crew training ones. So I, when I'm playing as a country that uses carriers, I am pretty much just researching all of these. Uh, and that might seem extreme to you, but I I find that it makes naval aviation incredibly powerful in this game. Uh, let's go. Let's backtrack and go to uh, tactical bombers, and we'll talk about tactical bombers and heavy bombers at the same time. So obviously, if you're using tax, you need these two techs. If you're using heavy bombers, you need these two techs. Uh, tactical bombers, though, are typically going to be doing. You, I, I don't like particularly like to use tactical bombers for logistical strikes and air base strikes. I, I prefer to use strategic bombers if I have them. If I don't, then that's fine, but you're not going to be able to do very effective. Ah, you can do air base strikes, but they're not, you know, strategic bombers are better at at both of these than tactical bombers. So it's something to keep in mind. Uh, 
if, you know, if you're going to use your tactical bombers mainly for ground attacks, then these are the three techs that you're going to research, right? This one being the most important, uh, this one being maybe the second important, most important in that one. Tactical Air Command has a similar role to uh, NAV Tactics. I'd say it's fairly important. Uh, it's fairly important because it will allow your bombers to continue to attack, although I find that it's not that important to do too much of this because typically your bombers are going to get intercepted unless you've totally obliterated the enemy interceptor force. So typically your bombers are going to get intercepted before they run out of org through the org penalty. So, But still, one or two rounds of that is, is not a bad idea. For strategic bombers, uh, it's more interesting. Uh, you're going to have these two technologies and then the missions that you're going to do. I, when I do strategic bombers, I like to have a, a fairly good logistical strike tactics. I like to have fairly good air base strike tactics and I like to have fairly good strategic bomber tactics. I would never research uh, installation strike because it's just not that useful. It's not that useful a mission. Uh, you know, hitting enemy radar is just not that useful. There's unfortunately there's no way to bomb forts uh, in this game, so that's it's a bit of a drag. There's no real way to do that. Um, you're just going to ground attack the units in the forts, uh, in the fort provinces. So installation strikes don't get confused. This does not uh, hit forts. This does not hit forts or coastal defenses or anything like that. Uh, it just it's I think it's meant to, but I think it's uh, I think it's they forgot to enable that function so don't bother with it uh the but these three here are are if you depending on which one you need more uh these three here are fantastic for heavy bombers and i find it worthwhile to research them if you're going to be doing a lot of strategic bombing type warfare uh airbase strike is good even if you're using tactical bombers because airbase strike is one of the key components of gaining air superiority it, you know it's one thing to win all the fights in the air it's another thing to uh destroy their forward airfield so that they're unable to repair their aircraft that will really cement uh, you know it will really mean that you're you are able to gain air superiority for long periods of time the faster you gain air superiority the more the easier it is is going to be for you to do a lot of risky bombing missions like uh, like strategic strategic uh, bombardments and logistical strikes so air base strike tactics is a very important technology in terms of strategic air command I don't find it to be at quite as important because I find that your strategic bombers if you are using strategic bombers I find that they're usually able to destroy their targets and to reduce their targets to rubble in one or two days of combat uh, one or two strikes usually does it if you're using tactical this is one of the weird things if you're using tactical bombers to do say airbase strikes this is more useful because airbase strikes are actually considered a strategic bombing type of bombing so having you know it may take them a week's worth of strategic uh, of sorry a week's worth of airbase strikes of runway cratering to actually reduce the air uh, level 10 airbase to, to zero for example so then it becomes more important to have this but not that important airborne assault tactics uh you know I don't know. This is I. I would do maybe one or two rounds of this if you're going to be doing a lot of uh, paratrooper stuff. But at the end of the day, I find that it's pretty rare that your when the paratroopers drop out of the cargo planes. I find that it's generally they generally don't get intercepted to the point where they're forced to flee. You know, or if they do, then I don't I don't think that airborne assault efficiency is actually going to prevent that from happening. So, unfortunately, it's just not the most useful tech. Also, it's a bit strange that the photo is showing a Stuka, because this attack this this affects um this affects uh, your airborne infantry. Uh, it affects the quality of your cargo planes specifically, so I, you know, I don't know. I can't really advocate this in good conscience. So yeah, that covers off the air, naval, land combat. We talked a little bit about theory as well, and I think that covers off technology in general. Uh, next episode, I am going to be uh, showing you... We're actually going to load up France, I think, next episode and go through the first few months of the game and talk about how to set up your diplomacy, your espionage, your politics, and things like that. And then I'll do another episode on the order of battle, and then I'll do some, ep some work on uh, land combat, air combat, and naval combat. So that's what's coming up. I hope you're enjoying this series. 
series. If you are, hit the subscribe button to see more. See you next time. Ciao.